delighted to have Roy now going to present the second talk uh, in a roaming fashion. So he's not going to have to be over here, but he's going to be able to uh, demonstrate where he is. So let me just put this on to uh, the screen for you. I think we'll send the first sample of rum because I'm sure you're anxious to taste some seaweed. <laughs> and let me first present myself. I'm really speaking to you tonight as an amateur, and, but I'm a happy amateur. I'm an amateur chef. I'm an amateur flavor scientist, and, and, and during my daily life, I'm really trained as a physical chemist, but I'm now a professor of theoretical physics. And you know. Um, the people who work in physics, they have the tendency to move around and do many different kinds of things. And what they are the driving force are really curiosity. So for the last um, about 10 years, I've been interested in the science of cooking. And I've taken great pleasure in doing a lot of research communication, taking <coughs> people's passion for food and flavor and health and nutrition, taking that as a starting point. And I've been writing popular science books about Japanese food, sushi, seaweed, and most recently, umami. But it's all on an amateur basis. And in fact, the paper, uh, Lars Williams and I, and my colleagues, our colleagues are publishing in Flavor, is the first scientific paper I've been writing in sort of food science and, and, and flavor science. So it's a great pleasure for me to be present here this evening, uh, the launch of Flavor, and tell you a bit about my experiences with a strange world, Maybe a strange world for some of you, which I'm going to tell you about, and that is the, the, uh, the uh, field of seaweeds, the sort of hidden uh, food stuff we have in, in our oceans. So let me, let me start maybe with a little uh, uh, gastronomical uh, gedanken experiment. We eat from the life of the, the, the tree of life, and we have the different kingdoms, and if the vegetarians and vegans among you are colonized, uh, or, excuse me for a minute, let's, let's imagine that you have a cuisine which is only based on the animal kingdom. And then you realize what you're missing. And of course, uh, the, the vegetarians will tell us what you're missing. So if someone comes along and says, well, you not only have the animal kingdom, I'll give you the plants as well. So imagine the richness you have in your cuisine by getting the plants. But now, there's yet another kingdom out there which in fact is the biggest kingdom in terms of organic mass. It's responsible for 80% of the organic production of Earth, fixation of carbon dioxide. And since these organisms are also performing photosynthesis, they're responsible for most of the oxygen in the air. And that's the algae. So I come and give you the algal kingdom. And as I say, it's, it's huge. And most of them are pretty small. They're unicellular and usually don't eat them. Some of them have good nutritional properties but many of them are actually poisonous. Um, but then there are the big algae, which you find in the, the ocean, the multicellular organisms, which we call seaweeds. And uh, there's actually three different classes, and uh, they are not very well defined, and uh, the colonists are still fighting uh, how we should classify them. But there's about 10,000 species. So I give you 10,000 new species. And so, Think of this just in a way as I give you plants. It's not that I give you tomatoes and potatoes and pulses. No, I give you 10,000 new um, uh, species. And usually they're classified after their color. It's not such that you always count on that. But we have green sea lettuce, an example. And I have some of them in, in jars up here in water. And you can come and have a look at them after the presentations. So we have the green ones. We have some red ones. The example I've given here is lather, or fire, which is also the source of making maki for Japanese sushi. And then there's an example of a brown seaweed, which is sugar kelp, which we're going to taste in a moment. The seaweed that is being passed around is actually the seaweed, which is on the very first uh, page here, that's called macro kelp. And I'll come back to that. It's the world's largest seaweed. It grows to be 60 meters. And I'll tell you a bit more, more about that. The point is, there's a lot of it out there. So if you're not used to eat seaweeds, um, imagine this wealth you get in terms of species and hence also flavors. 
And this is something I like you to keep in mind when you come to, to flavor. What you're going to taste during my presentation are just the raw materials that are being dried. And of course, you can see that they have different flavors, but imagine what a chef can do with them, what a chef like Lars can do with them. So it would be the same as I just send around, say, some dried tomatoes or some potatoes and some leeks, and you would say, well, that's nice, and they're different flavors, but imagine, once you get them in, in the kitchen, what, can, uh, what they can produce. Now, let me just uh, uh, give a little a piece of history here. This is a, this is a cartoon from Punch from, from the 18, uh, 1880s, and uh, this is what will happen during the uh, uh, weekend. The local priest will take people out in the, uh, the beach, and they'll pick up things and give them crazy names. And so here you can see the cartoonist is particularly the, uh, the people walking around with special clothes when they were sort of walking around in nature. I had the pleasure to browse around in the archives or in the, in the collections in the National History Museum out of Brunson Road. And um, up on the top gallery on the roof, there's a collection, the actual world's largest collection of seaweeds that they have about 600,000 species dried. And I found this little book, and in the book there's a poem, I'll read for you, it's a poem that was written in the early 1800s of a little girl, or maybe a teenager girl, in one of the Canal Islands. And um, the poem goes like this, Algae, bright order, by protagonist, defended, translate marine plants, as the Nils intended, you collect and admire us, we have used leisure hours, then call us not weeds, we are oceans, gay flowers. So here the seaweeds are speaking to us. And this, um, I'm, I'm reading this poem to you because seaweeds has a connotation of weeds and something where you do it like this. But it's just like if you were sort of not used to eat fish and you go and take rotten fish and you say, well, it doesn't smell very good, you can't eat that. And the same thing when you go on the beach and the, and the seaweed is totally rotten and it rots very quickly and expels a, a, a compound called dimethyl sulfide, which is what we also associate with with fish oil, and in large amounts, this is not really nice. However, in small amounts, this is exactly what we consider as the nice odor with the salty ocean fresh ocean. It's the, it's the, uh, uh, the products that are released by the algae when they are turned over. So don't call us weeds. And of course, at other places in the world, they try to get wrong by this calling them sea vegetables or sea greens, but let's call them sea weeds. That's, that's what they are. This is what's inside the book. So this is uh, what this girl she took, she took the different species and pressed them. It's a sort of a wonderful uh, example of of uh, uh, the pastime in in the Canal Islands. So the question is, can we eat it? And uh, I hope those of you who have tasted the seaweed, you would say it's edible. And by the way, uh, remind uh, yourself that you should drink some water along with it because the seaweed has been dried and it loses about. 90%, 80% of its weight become dry, and it's taking that water back when you put it in the mouth, and that's why it feels, feels dry. Can you eat stuff like this? So what you see here on the left hand side is soup kelp, and on the right hand side you have bladder rack, and certainly you can eat it, and um, I'll give you a little recipe on how to use bladder rack in, in a second. Now, um, I, I'll just read these two statements about seaweeds, uh, which people have uh, been expressing over time. The Roman poet, Virgil, who walked along the, the coast, and certainly he would probably walk in this raw seaweed, he would say, there's nothing more disgusting than seaweed, and he would certainly not eat it. But in, in Asia, and this is my point, is in Asia, people still eat seaweeds in large amounts. In this part of the world, we've forgotten to eat seaweeds, but we're about to rediscover them. But the wise Chinese who said that uh, seaweeds is appropriate for distinguished guests, even kings. So in Asia, China and Japan, other places in Asia, seaweeds has always been considered with, um, as something valuable. It's even been used to, to pay taxes and offerings to the, to the emperor. And of course, it's been, been eaten. So let me just uh, uh, start with something everyone knows uh, from the sushi bar. This is seaweed wrapped uh, maki, and uh, the seaweed which is wrapped around there is actually uh, uh, made by a process like making paper. You use, have lather, which you, uh, which you chop up in a, in a pulp like paper, and then you, 
that these these uh, pieces of, 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 of paper thin sheets in which the robes are made, but it's made from a red algae called papara or lava, and I also have some lava in some of the uh, in the dishes up here. You can have come and have a look at it. It's a wonderful uh, purple seaweed which is only one cell thick, and it, 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 despite of that, it's very sturdy. Let me take one and show you. Another one, which I'm sure you know, also from, from Japanese food, this is bakana, which is a brown seaweed, and you'll find it in soups like this. This is sumuro, which is Japanese soup broth. And this is now taking me to, to flavoring, because the question is, what does this taste from? And um, the flavor which you have in, in this Japanese uh, broth was uh, studied scientifically about 100 years ago by a Japanese chemist, Hikuna Ikeda. He started in Europe, he was a physical chemist, and when he came back to Japan, he set his mind to figure out how come that this soup tastes what the Japanese say, tastes umai, tastes delicious. And in order to understand um, what he then starts studying, you have to know how you make such a soup. It's based on a broth called dashi, and dashi is made from two components. And one component is, of course, seaweed, otherwise I would not be talking about it. And it's a giant brown seaweed uh, called kanbu or Sabrina japonica. And you will find it in, in uh, most Asian shops in different qualities. And I have some here. It's farmed in, in, uh, in the ocean, in Hokkaido, and from very big plates like this. And um, when you come and look at them and you say, he brought something that looks very dirty, there's some spots on it. And the spots that is on, on this is actually where the flavor is. This is where the flavor, which I'm going to tell you about now, that is where it resides. So the way to make this dashi, and uh, probably the last will tell more about it, and it's also uh, explained in, the, in, in the, lots of the classical recipes and also in the paper we've been writing, that is you make a sort of lukewarm extract, not too hot water, 60 or maybe up to 100 degrees, depending on which recipe you're using. And Lars has been exploring this and tried to figure out an optimal way of extracting what is coming out of this seaweed. So we extract it and it gets a flavor which is very mild, Swedish, and it tastes umai. And once, you, once you've done that, you take away the seaweed and then you plunge in a product called katsubushi, which is a fish that is preserved five times over. It's uh, cooked, it's salted, it's smoked, it's dried, it's fermented, and then it gets to uh, be a, a hard piece almost like wood, and then it's shaken in fine uh, pieces and tossed into the soup, brought up to the boiling point, and then the soup is ready. You then, um, you then put everything through a sieve, and then you have this clear soup. That's the dashi. And the dashi um, gets its flavor from what? Ikeda found by analyzing what's in the seaweed. And here's the first piece of chemistry. And what he realized in this seaweed is that the large amount of an amino acid or a sort of amino acid called uh, monosodium glutamate, a small molecule with only 17 atoms, and he said that's the, that's the source of the umami flavor. And uh, he didn't, at that time, he didn't say umami. Which said it was delicious, so he coined this word umami as a combination of umai and me, which means the essence, the essence of deliciousness. So this is the basis for, for umami, and um, that's of course not the whole story, because what about the fish? So um, until about 10 years ago, the umami flavor was not really recognized in the West, in this, in, at least not amongst uh, sent, uh, sense physiological people, and the reason for that was that there was no sort of receptor, a molecule that can identify this flavor that was still not discovered. It was discovered about 10 years ago, and uh, it's a wonderful mechanism, and I'll just explain it to you, because once you know that mechanism, you also know why 
um, you do certain things in the, in the, in the kitchen um, that uh, provides for, for the umami flavor. And, and the point is that the receptor is like a, 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 a Venus flytrap. You know, this plant that catches insects, and in the hinge, that's the place where it binds um, uh, the glutamate. So this receptor exists in the, in the, in the taste cell walls, in the, in the, in the taste box, or the, the sensory cells in the taste box. So here you have the taste box in the cell, and this is the, 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 the taste box in the tongue, and this is the, the cells, and here you see the cell membrane, and in the cell membrane you have the receptors, the antennas that can identify the, the taste compounds. So this is a binding site for glutamate, and now it has been discovered there's a peripheral binding site for another set of compounds called nucleotides. And the nucleotides have the products or the simple uh, um, the molecules that are broken down from the nucleic acids that you have in the cells. And, and the mechanism of the receptor is such that small amounts of the nucleotides can enhance the binding, binding affinity of glutamate. And glutamate and dashi uh, comes from seaweed and the nucleotides, which in this case from an amino acid called um, nucleic acid, inosinate, comes from the fish. So it's broken down from the fish during this five times over conservation. And when these things are come together, you get this synergy. And in fact, we now have been doing calculations on this receptor, and as the reason have found that we can sort of explain this extra binding by uh, a change in dynamics of the receptor, um, and that is the, 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 the molecular explanation of, of, the, of, the, of the synergy. So if you want delicious taste, it's not enough to have glutamate, you have something that goes with it, you have to have these nucleotides. Let me just give you one recipe. It's a very simple soup made of green peas. The green peas, there's a lot of glutamate, and in that one, I've tossed in a piece of, of scallop. And scallop has a lot of added, something called adenylate, which is a nucleotide. And then there's, of course, also some seaweed. So that's sort of really enhancing the umami flavor. So this kind of pairing, which is different from other types of, 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 of um, uh, flavor pairing, that's based, this is based on, on a biochemical principle, which is normal. So you can take your own kitchen and go through it and see whenever you have something that is, that, that is delicious. It's usually a pair of compounds that brings both of these two things together. And there are actually very few raw materials that have both. The porphyra in Mahi is an example of one that has both, but usually you need to bring them in a pair. Eggs and bacon is an example. Egg will glutamate and bacon will nutinate. Uh, mackerel in, in the Sunrise Tomato uh, paint is another example. A pizza is a study in umami where you start with it's basically a tasteless piece of bread and then you add the, uh, the, uh, the tomato paste which, and when you have sun dried tomatoes, are very dry tomatoes with a lot of glutamate and then you need some nucleotides. What do you do? You add some anchovies or some um, some other kind of fish. You can easily use, um, um, uh, well, various kinds of meats. Uh, you can have uh, the, the, the dried ham. And if you want extra glutamate, you will toss on some Parmesan cheese. So get a lot of glutamate and free glutamate and also free nucleotides in, 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 in food stuff that is matured, that is fermented, that is aged. So you have to sort of punish the proteins in your food in order to get it out. So that's what cooking is about. That's really sort of trying to break down the, uh, the proteins to get the free uh, 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 amino acids and, and the nucleotides. Now, let me tell you about what you had as the first taste here. That's the world's largest seaweed. And the guy here on the, on the, on the, on the um, picture, his name is Louis Drew. He's a very famous Psychologist, that is, he's studying algae. He lives at the west coast of Vancouver Island and he has a little company where he harvests macro kelp. So the first taster, it has been sent along, I suppose. The first taster is actually from Lewis's macro kelp. It's something you don't buy. I mean, you get it because I bring it to you. 
And uh, I think this is one of the most delicious types of seaweed. It has uh, umami, and then of course it also has a, a salty flavor. I'll come back to what salts they are uh, towards the end. So I said this is the world's largest seaweed. It grows up to be 60 meters in a season. And if you do the calculation in, 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 during the time where it grows the fastest, it's two centimeters an hour. So I put this in perspective if we are interested in sustainability and providing food stuff for a health for, for a hungry world, this is a place to look that's enormous organic production. So this has been about brown seaweeds. Then this is the sort of the um, um, the star tonight, because this is what you're going to taste in some of Lars's food. That's a red seaweed called dulse, and uh, it's still eaten in a lot of places in Europe, in coastal areas, in Ireland, in Brittany, in Iceland, uh, Nova Scotia, Maine, also British Columbia. And it's one of the most delectable seaweeds I know. And I think we should send it around now, the uh, dulse. So uh, I have to confess, this is my favorite. And I think also the chef's uh, is one of the chef's favorite, and this is what, what Lars has been playing around the Nordic Food Lab, trying to get um, extracts of this seaweed, both eating it as it is, but also making dashi. So the question is, can you make dashi out of this? And in fact, uh, apart from the, from the Japanese kongu, which is uh, very well known as a source of, of, of uh, uh, glutamate for dashi, not many other seaweeds have been used. And for instance, if you try to make a dashi from Arkhamba, you will be very disappointed because it hardly has any glutamate. So the question is, does this have any glutamate? And so we set out because the chefs say this is good flavor, and I agree with them, and they can make a broth out of it. The question is, is this because it has a lot of glutamate? So this is a competitor to the Japanese kombu. So, um, and Lars and his colleagues made a lot of extracts, and um, uh, here you can see some extracts of, of, um, of the red seaweed, the dolls here, to be compared with the classical Ichiban dashi, the first dashi of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Japanese production using kondu and katsuobushi, this fish, and this is just a straight kondu dashi, which is just the pure extract of, of kondu, so you can see the colors. And the question is, what's, what's in this? So we, and this is where the science comes in. This is a, a, a picture from Lars's kitchen or laboratory. I don't know what you what would call it. But the way uh, chefs like Lars and his colleagues are doing together with scientists, that's of course, they work like chefs. They use the whole arsenal to the measuring devices they have in their mouth. Of course, they taste the taste buds. And if you go and see how Lars works in this lab, one of the most important instruments he's got, that's the spoon in his, in his pocket. And he'll take a spoon and, and spoon things up and, and, and taste it. And then, of course, where science comes in is when you do things systematically and actually go and measure, you can make hypotheses and go and measure and see is it, is it in this case true that you have um, a high amounts of glutamate that can support the fact that this is a good dashi. And this is what we've, we've found and this is what we've written about in one of these first papers. In, in the new journal flavor, and you can read that in the material that has been sent around. And since I'm a scientist, I'll just show you one diagram, and this is the so-called amino acid profile of two different dashis. It's a classical dashi uh, made from for, for rancid kondu. It's one of the better qualities of kondu. There's a whole range of qualities, and if you measure the amount of glutamate you can get out of kondu, you actually see this amount correlates with with what the Japanese call the quality. So this is a fairly good quality, and we measured the different amino acids, and there are a whole lot of peaks here, I don't have to go into the details, but you can see that some that really gives high, high uh, counts here, and that's, that's uh, the, the glutamic acid or the glutamate. So the gray the columns here are the dashi from, from the kombu, and, and the other one is from dolls. We also studied other seaweeds, uh, uh, sugar kale, and, and um, something called Castellaria, and in all cases they have hardly any uh, uh, good of it. So there is a lot. But you also see differences between the gray and the black bars. And that is actually something Glass and his colleagues can pick up with the taste buds. Because this dashi from the, from the, from the dogs, it's more complex. 
And the way we can decode the complexity in terms of flavor is that it not only has a mind, but it also has sweet flavors and also some bitter flavors. And some of them are certainly due to the distribution of amino acids because we find also some of the sweet amino acids and some of the bitter ones. However, what really makes dashi bitter when you cook it or boil it is other compounds. It's, it's probably polyphenols so that are much more bitter. Um, before we leave the, um, the, um, the, um, the um, red seaweeds, let me just remind you that many of you have probably used recipes with this classical Aries Moss, which is a very good carrageenan provider. It provides a, a stiffening agent, carrageenan, which I mentioned briefly just in a second again. And there are large amounts of that in, in this carrageenan or, or Aries, Aries Moss. And I have some Aries Moss in the water up here, which you can come and have a look at. And um, let's, let's um, finish with the, with the green ones. And now we're ready to have the sea lettuce. It's been around great. Yeah. And uh, now, you, those of you who have the, uh, the sea lettuce, which is the green seaweed, will probably agree with me. It has a completely different flavor. And um, this, is, this is great to put in a dressing. It's good to put in bread. So the bread, we bake at home. In, in, in my kitchen, I actually always have some seaweeds in it, and we use the green a lot, uh, because it has an interesting flavor of the ocean, and it's also a very good salt keeper. So I can already now tell you that we're making bread at home with hardly any salt, because sea, the seaweed can substitute for the salt, and as I'll describe on the very last, last slide, this is not sodium chloride, this is potassium chloride. So it's good news for the blood pressure elevation. So it has almost the same salt value, but it's, it's, it's a low weight of potassium salt. Before I, I um, uh, come to a few examples of using this flavor in gastronomical dishes, and then give the floor to, to Lars, let me just um, tell you about one of the failures we've had. And you know when we certainly do things in the kitchen, and also when we do things in the scientific lab, we have failures, we have we're doing things that turns out not to be as we expected or hope. Here's an example of a, <coughs> a, a kind of, of um, a kelp, a sugar kelp, a big brown, which is quite common in our orders. That's not very good for making dashi, and uh, what we found was that it has hardly any glutamate, and on top of that it also provides for a very viscous extract. And that's because a lot of polysaccharides seeps out, and all of you who have been swimming uh, with sugar kelp or touch sugar kelp will know what I'm speaking about. It has this slimy excrete on the outside, and that's, that's polysaccharides. And by the way, the reason why we call it sugar kelp is it has fairly large amounts of a sugar alcohol called mannitol. And if you see little spots on the sugar kelp that is being passed around, that's actually probably mannitol that has been seeped out and sits dry on the <coughs> surface. And has a sweetness about 60% of that of sucrose, table sugar. So you might even think of it and as using as a sugar substitute. And it's interesting because the no is we don't have enzymes to, to digest the, to, to, to digest this compound. So um, before I, I uh, talk about uh, gastronomy, let me just show you this slide and do one experiment, which I'll ask Lars to help him to do. Um, let me just go through this very quickly. And actually, there's an upcoming uh, paper I wrote about the gastrophysics of seaweeds that will come in one of the next issues of flavor, so you can get the data there. And here, I just repeat what you got in seaweeds from the point of view of nutrition. So we've been speaking about flavor and delicious food, uh, but let me just make a statement with this slide. And that is that you see we basically have everything you need except calories. You can't live with seaweed because there's not enough calories. And that's because the high carbohydrates or polysaccharides are very complex. We don't have the enzymes to digest them, so there's no calories. So uh, not much calories. High, high protein. You have these dietary fibers. That's the nutritionist names for the polysaccharides and the carbohydrates. Very large amounts for the digestion. You have the um, most important vitamins, even B12, which you don't find in land, land plants. Um, 
there's no D vitamin available. Iodine, um, very, very good depending on which species there is. There's more potassium salts than sodium salt, and this is what I, what I already uh, mentioned to you. And then on a, on a draw weight basis, the, um, the mineral content is typically 10 times as large as, as in plants. So these are very good uh, for, for giving you minerals. So if you tell your kids to eat spinach because they get iron from spinach, I say eat, eat uh, sea lettuce because they're much more iron than sea lettuce. The trace compounds, and what really interests me, and this is basically the, the way I got started interested in, in seaweeds, because my profession in, in, as a biophysicist is to study the biological membranes and the fascial membranes, the lipids, and the lipids that you find in seaweed, as well as other stuff, uh, uh, food from the ocean, that's very high in potent saturated fatty acids. In fact, the sea and the lower part of the food chain, the algae, that is the provider of the omega-3 fatty acids. That's where it's produced. They have the enzymes to make these compounds. Then they accumulate in fish and shellfish, and that's where we get the largest amount. But if you want to go to the source of the potent saturated fatty acids, you go to the kingdom of the algae. That's where it's produced. And even though they're only 2 to 5 percent, it's still actually more than in marine fish. And we still don't know whether, in this form, they're here, whether they're more precious than other kinds of food, because um, we don't know too much about the antioxidants that they, they come along with. So that's something to discover. What is the most interesting from the point of view of nutrition, and also maybe from the point of view of, of evolution, based on what sort of the question, what should people like us eat with the genes we've got, the ratio between omega-3 and omega-6 is close to 1 in seaweeds, and that's the same also in, 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 in fish and shellfish, or at least it's, it's comparable to uh, the two amounts uh, are comparable. In fact, the dose you, you're having, you have four times as much omega-3 as omega-6. One of our, the major problems we, we have in the Western world, that is the food we eat is overloaded with omega-6 on the expense of omega-3. So in Europe, we typically eat five to eight times. Are we doing all right with this? Five times, eight times. Okay, I'll go over. We eat uh, five to eight times more omega six than omega three. In the United States, it's twenty times. So that's the way we're going. And this is not what our our genes are telling us to eat. So now I'll do um, an experiment with us. And I think, do I have this? Two or three more minutes. We we'll should just do an experiment to, to, just to show you the marvelous thing with seaweeds. And we're going to, I'm going to take a dry piece of seaweed, the very same as you got as the first taster. And I'll show you how it looks when it's dry. And, and we'll put it in water, and then we'll see what's going to happen. And I think we can use this water. Did you, did you hold it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, we are we, we, we traveling around doing this experiment. So, so this is the kind of stuff you just got. It's a dry piece of seaweed, and it's been sitting. I think I've had it for half a year. It can last for a very long time when it's dry. It sucks up water in your mouth. It's taking the water back as it's given uh, off when it was dry. Now we'll put it in water. <laughs> it's the world's largest brown seaweed. <coughs> To 
thank you, guys. So, so now you can draw it again, but of course it's losing some of its salt when you put it in, 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 the, in water. So let me just finish off um, with a few examples of how um, and I've worked with chefs um, over the last couple of years, and this is uh, an introduction to to um, to Lars. So I'm just going to tell you about how he's using extracts of the red seaweed dolls to infuse different kinds of dishes to impart dishes and flavors with the seaweed, in particular for mommy flavor. So I'm going to take this show from from you, but let me show you a couple of other examples. This is a dish from Noma, where they're using uh, a green. Uh, seaweed, the sea lettuce, which is sort of the whale sitting over some raw shrimp, which is underneath here. So the, this is the raw sea lettuce that provides for this beautiful cover of the sort of hidden treasure underneath uh, the shrimps and then the various kind of, of herbs uh, from the beach on, on top. This is a um, uh, 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 scientist from Jakob a Danish chef whom I've been working on, on my book on seaweeds. And, and uh, Jakob is very preoccupied with flowers, presentation of flowers. You see this here with flowers, which is actually a um, fish dish. And he's garnished it with two types of seaweed. There's a macro kelp, which last night I just put in water. And then there's a um, rehydrated iris moss. And the moss here has colors purple, from purple all the way from purple to white. And it starts being very red when it's fresh, but when, when you bleach it, you get different colors. You can make wonderful presentations. The interesting thing with this uh, seaweed is it doesn't have much taste. But that brings me back to some of the things Pierre said, because the perception of flavor is not only taste and odor, it's also the texture and the mouth, the resistance you have when you chew. So this is a very interesting way of of um, uh, perceiving the flavor of seaweed, that is the mechanical resistance of the mouth. It's interesting to chew, sometimes it's even crunchy. And by the way, I, I, I promised to give you a recipe using bladder rag. I forgot it, but it's very simple. You just take the fresh bladder rag, the outermost tips, throw them in, in hot water, that is, you, you blanch them, and then put it in the nice water. And then you have, uh, the, by the, first of all, they turn completely um, uh, um, light green. They don't have much taste, but they have interesting texture. They're very wonderful to chew, so it's good to put in a, in a salad. And finally, let me show this piece of work, and this is another chef, uh, Klaus Stueck, with whom I last year wrote a book about Romani. And here's an example of Klaus is using, it's basically an old, uh, old trick from from um, from Harris by I'm meeting uh, in Venice, and then how can you how can you eat raw uh, uh, wheel or raw meat which hardly has any taste? <coughs> so, well, you have to add umami, and one way of adding umami is to have an emulsion. Uh, it's a mayonnaise with some umami giver. It could be English sauce, or it could, in this case, Klaus is using the red sea meat. So, in this way, you make this meat. And I admit mean that I don't think this meat is tasty at all. It doesn't taste of anything you have to add at umami. So here is the seaweed used to, to add umami. And I think, I think I now made it to the end. Uh, but I'll just finish with this, this picture here. This is a Japanese tank. And we started in Japan talking about uh, flavor and umami. And I talked uh, talk to you about dashi. And we talked about making dashi from seaweed and fish. But of course, if you're a Buddhist or vegetarian, you don't eat fish, so what do you do? So it's the, the same monks in the, in the temples in Kyoto in the, in the 1300s that they discovered you could make a wonderful dashi replacing the fish that is the katsubushi by shiitake, dry shiitake mushrooms. And we now know why that works. And that's because in the dry shiitake mushrooms, there's very high levels of a nucleotide called guanolate, which then resembles the inosinate from the fish. In fact, the synergy that can be provided by guanolate is much, much more powerful. So a dashi made from a seaweed extract with, with the with shiitake mushrooms, that's a wonderful dashi. And I'd like to close with this note, because um, um, we talk about flavor and we talk about delicious food, but we also have huge problems with nutrition and lifestyle diseases. 
We have problems with some of our East too much. We have elderly citizens and sick people who eat too little. The question is how can we provide uh, delicious food for them? And just to take a, a, an example, I, I don't know if you would have the same problem as me. I have problems eating 600 grams of green stuff every day, vegetables, whatever it may be. And I think it's because it doesn't taste good enough. And uh, the monks have discovered what, what the secret is that is to impart umami to it. So I think the lesson here from the temples and the lessons for using flavor and also not only making delicious meals but also healthy meals and uh, providing us with ways in our home kitchen to actually uh, make food that um, is delicious even with vegetables. Dashi, where there's glasses dashi or your own dashi and the inside and looking for the synergy between glutamate and nuclear and, and the nucleotides may actually uh, help us in that direction. Thank you very much for your attention.